starting the uh, basics of Christianity. Uh, over 12 weeks we've been starting it, and today it's becoming like Christ. And so, and so this becomes just a powerful time for us. We're, we're talking about becoming like Jesus. And so there's some scripture that goes along with this. Um, and uh, there's 12 weeks, of course you know that. Uh, here's, here's John 1, verse 1 beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Then there's a gap and we begin at nine. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. By means of introduction, we're going to be asking these simple questions. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? And for those who are are working in a new believers class, uh, this will be one of the part of your conversation, who is he, where did he come from, where is he now? And for those in the New Believers course, we know you're going to enjoy that, that discovery. Now, point one, who is Jesus Christ? Well, quite simply, Jesus is God. Uh, there, there are different aspects of the creator, Jesus When we're talking about the creator, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is God. He is the Messiah. And he is ultimately proof of eternal life. Jesus is God. Well, the word became flesh. Made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Knows all things, created all things. Christ, you might know, is not Jesus' last name. It's not like Robert Hayes. And, 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 and that, that becomes a little confusing he, because really it's the title, Jesus the Christ. And it means anointed one. The most common reading is Jesus the anointed one. And often he's, he's called that as part of his, his name and, and, and part of who he is is Jesus is God. Who is he? Well, he is anointed. And who's he anointed by? It's not like we all took a vote. Let's let's just call him the Christ. No, no. He was anointed that by virtue of the Godhead, by by virtue of who he actually is, and, and what his job is, what his character is, what his role is, Jesus the Christ. The anointed one for what? Well, let's talk about this. He's also the Messiah. Now, what does Messiah mean? Because he was also called Jesus the Messiah. Messiah also means anointed one. But don't get confused. In context, the Messiah, which is translated both in Hebrew and Greek, anointed one, has the connotation of the expected anointed one. The long expected one who is anointed... To what? 
to provide mankind eternal life. Jesus, the anointed one, was here, came so that he might prove that there is life after. And how did he do that? Well, we look at an empty cross, that's how he did that. Really, we should be looking not only the empty cross, we should be looking at the rolled away stone from the grave. We should be looking at how many times Jesus, in his new body, began to talk to people and explain what happened. Even if you're Thomas, even if you doubt it, even unless, unless I get to, to put my hand where the, 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 the scars were and where the holes were, I don't think I would believe, and then Jesus showed up. Oh, I believe. It's what happens when Jesus shows up. Proof of eternal life. The fact that he died and three days later came back to life showed that he had the power over sin and of death. It's good to know. Those of us who are getting older, power over death. Wow. And that, that, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now present in our lives. Read Romans 8. Romans 8 is a fantastic diatribe about, about what God has done in Jesus Christ. Jesus is proof of eternal life. Who is he? Jesus is God. He is Messiah. He's proof. Matthew chapter 1 I'll read just the first couple of verses. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Jesus has been given the fact that he's proven over genealogy. He's not just an ordinary man. He's in a lineage. He's, it's, like, it's like providing your birth certificate back in those days. It's proof that he is who he says he is. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, and I will read this and follow along, beginning in verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And through him also, he, he made the universe. So you're not just talking earth. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Let's look at who is Jesus now. And I realize the titles in your, in, your, uh, in your bulletin are not the exact same. So this is point two. And you can just scratch out or add this to the side of it. Who is Jesus now? So he has always been God. In the beginning, God. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. And then John is saying, and in that, in that beginning, God, in that beginning, Jesus. He's always been God. He just, he just left heaven so that he could do his thing on our behalf. And his thing, and not to minimize that at all, his thing was to invade our lives, forgive us from our sin, Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and present us pure before the Father. He's always been God. His being, this radiance of, of the glory. Now, think of that. He is the radiance. Radiance is that which emanates. That, that which emanates in the Godhead. And Jesus is the radiant. He is the emanation of God. That, that, that is purely him, that is, that is the exact representation of him. Now think, think about that for a second. Because it's the same wording, listen to this, same wording, man was created in God's... Wow. 
We, in the Garden of Eden, as we walked with Christ, were the radiance of God's glory. Our sin destroyed that. And meant that Jesus, who was and continues to be the radiance of God's glory, came in order to restore our radiance again. Imagine. So if you know Jesus Christ and you have asked him to be seated with you, that his spirit be united with your spirit, and so he now resides there he resides and even now reclaims the radiance of his glory. It's part of the job of the Holy Spirit. It's part of what, what, what the power is that, that the radiance of God's glory and, and he left his Holy Spirit so that, so that he could invade us again and take charge. He always has been God. His being, the radiance of glory, he's the stainer of all things now. In the past, back to verse 1 of Hebrews, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. So we heard them. We, we, we had the, that, that written in, in oral tradition. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You are not sustained by your own strength. The world does not continue to spin on, his, on its axis and receive the warmth from the sun. It doesn't continue to do that. The universe uh, doesn't continue to spin and develop and explode um, uh, eons and eons and eons away by accident. But by God's word... He sustains it all. Christian, you and I are not sustained by the kind of vegetables you eat, pills you take. I mean, they help. But the sustaining of your soul and spirit is only by the word of God, Jesus. He is your sustaining power. Where do you lift your eyes? I lift my eyes to the hills. Where comes my help? That's, that's where it is. His, his power, his sustaining word. And it's not just his word, his powerful word. And when you say powerful, it's not like we know power. This is like the all-encompassing power who is able to do anything he wills by his word. Who is Jesus now? He has always been God. His being radiance of glory. He is the sustainer of all things now. That's who he is. He's not the one who walked on the earth any longer. He's not the one that turned water into wine any longer. He's not, he's not the one that, that, that was betrayed and was handed over and was crucified any longer. He is now the sustainer of all things. His being is the radiance of God's glory. He's been God. He always has been God. Praise God. Let's focus on Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3 said, After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So Hebrews 1 verse 3 now talks about something very, very different. Jesus now is in the best position. What is he doing now? He's in the very best position now. He is in the position of all might and all power. He sat down. Many of you know what that indicates. When Jesus... When Jesus had completed what he needed to do. 1 verse 3, after he had provided purification for sins. He did that. And after he had provided purification for sins and all of that, he sat down. 
What did that mean? It meant he was done. He'd accomplished what he wanted to do. For us all. Not only for, for those of us that exist now, but all who will be Christians after us. He accomplished that. It was done. Past tense. After he had accomplished, provided purification for sin, he sat down. Wow. Didn't sit anywhere. Didn't mean he just needed a step stool because he was exhausted. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Man. When he sat down, all the power and the place of authority was his. He sat down at the place of authority. The right hand of God, the right hand of the Father, he sat down and now he rules and reigns from there with all power. And it means all power, which is the place of total authority. He'd been given it. It's his. When you pray, we've touched this a number of times, you pray and Jesus translates and submits it. And so, and so as we pray, Jesus very often through the Holy Spirit interprets even what we don't know how to pray. How many of you sat down and said, oh. Lately when I stand up, I go, oh. When we're trying to communicate our stuff, and we've been there so many times, and all that comes out is, Lord, you know. Anybody tired of praying the same thing? It's okay. He gets it. He's all the power and all the authority that's been given to him. And yet it's so personal still. It's all of that and it's all of this too. Lord, you're probably too busy, but the word all encompasses the big and the little. God isn't just seated up there now and, and is an absentee landlord. And sometimes we think, oh, unless I, I just can't yell high enough, and I, will it reach those, those gates? Will it get to the throne room? Remember how Jesus asked us to pray, go in your closet quietly? Because what said is secret is understood in secret. You don't need to blare it. You don't need to yell. You don't need to trumpet it. No, no. The whisper or the thought life Jesus immediately gets. It's in his throne room like that. God has said, I am never very far away from you. He sat down. All his power in that place of authority with the majesty in heaven. Majesty is very often interpreted strength with all the strength, with all the exuberance, with all of the stuff that comes with majesty, with royalty, with, with what, what that all entails. It's such a complex word. We say majesty in heaven. I'm not sure that English really could encapsulate what that means in a single word. That's why it's going to be so unbelievably different in every way when we stand before his majesty. Imagine. Our words can't get it. Our words don't fully, but there we will be. 
before the very light of the world, before the very light of the universe, with all of his glory and radiance, no wonder we're going to need new bodies. I'm kind of excited about that. I mean, that's, that, that should be pretty cool. I, I know I, I don't have really a vision what that might look like. Dot might. But I don't. Because I can't comprehend God in that state. Jesus in that state. The Holy Spirit in that state. I can't envision what I will be in that state. What we see now in Christ with the joy that we have experienced is just a taste. When we see somebody coming to know Christ with all the exuberance that's there, it's just a taste. When Jesus reaches down and does a miracle because you have prayed and asked God for something, it's just a taste. The joy we feel, the contentment we feel, the experience of the Holy Spirit working in our lives to impact other people, all of that stuff, it's just a taste. Because we will be with him in his majesty. Jesus says famously that where I am, there you may be also. There we go. To the thief on the cross, Today, today, today you will be in paradise with me. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that's not an argument against various places, places in the heavenlies where we might go through. But it is pretty secure. Biblical truth is that when you die, you will be with Jesus. Do you get that? When you die, wherever he is, you will be too. Changes the nature of my funeral. I, I mean, I've said goodbye to a lot of people, you know, in my years, uh, not only having family, but pastoring. So we've said goodbye to a lot. And I can honestly say there's not been a single Christian funeral I've done that was a drag. Oh, there's tears. Oh, for goodness sake, there's lots of tears. And sometimes it's uncontrollable. And then God takes over. And then eventually. So missing people is part of the gig. Because we will miss people here on earth. But understand this. We don't mourn like people who have no hope. And part of that is because of the majesty thing. Part of that is because of what we get to look forward to. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Let's take some stuff home. There's a few things here, so pens at the ready. His spirit is seated in you. Take home. His spirit is now seated with you. If you know Christ, his spirit has taken a seat. His spirit has completed it. In every sense of the term, when you know Jesus Christ, it is finished. You are declared righteous. Lord, would you forgive me for my sin and would you, would you take over my life? Would your spirit please invade my life? I acknowledge you as Lord. Jesus, you are Savior. Jesus, I need you. I want you. I do not want to live like this anymore. Whether those words are your words or it's just what you're feeling, you're like, I'm done, Lord. Come on in. It's finished then. Jesus has declared you righteous. You haven't attained it, but he's declared it. The judgment is off you. What he said is all your debt is paid in full. Jesus paid that. His spirit is seated in you. You are God's plan. <laughs> you are God's plan. I mean, that's why he came. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. That was his plan. That's why Jesus came. He came for you. He sustains you. His word, his sustaining power is what we rely on. He sustains you. He's completing you. You are not today what you are going to be tomorrow. We keep moving and growing. He's completing you. He's, he's, he's part of that process. Rob Hayes is not the Rob Hayes that he will be a year from now. And you should go, oh, thank the Lord. We're all growing, kids. We all make mistakes, blunder. There's forgiveness. I'm still righteous. When he looks at me, he sees Jesus. And if you, by some miracle, sense that God is speaking to you, that his spirit is nudging you in his direction, accept his invitation. It's his invitation, by the way. It's not what I'm inviting you to. This is just his invitation. Respond to him naturally and honestly. Because in spirit and in truth is what he hears, is what he accepts. So in spirit and truth, receive him. He's here. So you will be able to be with him and enjoy him for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, in your own way, in your own words, speak and sustain us with power. And for those who are just right now admitting that they need you and are inviting you to come and tabernacle live with them, we pray against the enemy that would provide all kinds of excuses, why not? And we ask the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen.